Hi, I'm Elena Goodnow. I'm the Assistant Director at Burrett Public Library. And along with our friends at BCTV, we're bringing you this program today at the Center for Wildlife. Now, normally the Center for Wildlife visits us at the library, but today we are here visiting them at their new beautiful facility in Cape Nettick, Maine. Now, this building is not currently open to the public, but we're about to meet Katie Broder, and she's going to tell us all about their new building and their plans for the future, and introduce us to some of their animal ambassadors. Hi, my name is Katie Broder. I'm the Education and Outreach Specialist at the Center for Wildlife. We are here in front of the amphitheater of our beautiful new building. It was a many, many years in the making process, a $5.5 million capital campaign. There is still uh, around 150,000 left to raise. So if you are interested, please go to our website to learn more about that. Uh, this is where we would normally host uh, field trips and group programs. We are so excited to hopefully soon be able to welcome groups um, of families, Girl Scout troops, um, entire you know classrooms someday to, uh, to the Center for Wildlife. We're incredibly excited. So thank you so much for joining us. Next, we're going to meet some of our non-releasable animal ambassadors up in our beautiful amphitheater. So today we have a couple of our raptor ambassadors to be introduced to you all. They are um, two of our flighted birds that are also amazing hunters. Um, so we're going to be meeting a couple of our raptors as well as a couple of our reptiles. We have um, a few types of reptiles that are here in Maine, not too many, it's a little cold, but uh, we're going to be meeting a turtle and a snake as well today. So we're gonna start out with one of our raptors, our beautiful uh, peregrine falcon, Perry, um, and we're gonna chat all about him and what, he, um, what his story is, how he came to the Center for Wildlife, and also his species and how incredible they are. So Perry is our beautiful Peregrine Falcon Ambassador, and I'll get him out for you guys. Hi. Step up. Hi. Hi, buddy. This is Perry. Um, Peregrine Falcons are amazing animals. They're a member of the falcon family um, who are all known for their really streamlined body type and incredibly pointed um, wings and um, structure. They are evolved for speed. So peregrine falcons are officially the fastest animals on the planet. They can dive off of the top of mountains or cliffs and get up to speeds as high as 300 miles per hour. Every time we measure, it keeps going up. So um, they are incredibly fast birds, the fastest animals on the planet. They also have adapted to hunt and utilize that speed to allow them to catch prey that is moving very quickly. So these guys are, other, they eat other birds. They are bird eaters. They will typically dive down off the top of a mountain or cliff and uh, zoom down towards another bird, a pigeon, a duck, um, a gull, anything like that. Um, they'll come up on it with their talons, these beautiful feet that Perry has, wrapped up in a little fist, and they'll literally punch other birds right out of the air. And the stunning effect of that at 300 miles an hour is enough to knock their prey out and um, render them you know, easily catchable. So um, incredible, incredible hunters. They are uh, doing quite well in our area, although that is not without quite a bit of effort from the peregrines themselves, uh, adapting to humans, as well as us doing many, um, many things to help conserve their species. Did you, did you hear that? Yeah, that's his amazingly fast wings. Um, these guys were critically endangered for many years and uh, it took quite a concerted conservation effort on the part of the entire country to really bring them back. Um, Rachel Carson outlined in her seminal book, Silent Spring, how the effects of pesticides that we were putting into our environment really hurt our songbirds, our ecosystems, and our peregrine falcons. Yeah, I know. 
Peregrines um, were suffering from an accumulation of the toxin DDT in their system. It impacted their ability to lay their eggs, to, um, to nest successfully, and it ultimately led to a huge decline in peregrine populations as well as other raptors like eagles and hawks. Um, so after this revelation, um, the EPA was founded, the, um, the Endangered Species Act was uh, created to protect species like peregrine falcons, and they were officially delisted in 1999 after uh, DDT was banned and many um, conservation efforts into conserving the raptor populations and the habitat that they live in went um, very successfully. So peregrine falcons also adapted to living more comfortably near humans. This is something we see over and over again is um, as humans develop, the species that live close to us and adapt to living close to us are the ones that are successful. So. Uh, peregrine falcons have adapted to live on skyscrapers, on bridges, um, on overlooks, anything that looks like a mountain or a cliff, they are um, pretty good at living on. You're showing off, yeah. Um, so we have them on, you know, bridges in Portsmouth, in, um, in skyscra on skyscrapers in our big cities, like the Empire State Building has several nesting pairs. And um, there's usually pr plenty of food for them to eat in a city setting in the form of other birds like pigeons or sparrows. So um, they have done tremendously well at adapting to us and we have also conserved them uh, very uh, intentionally. So those efforts are really a huge part of why we still have peregrines around today along with our eagles and osprey and other hawk species. Um, but it took a lot of work and that is work that is well worth it to conserve these guys. They help us to keep our um, pest populations down. They help to keep uh, other bird species in check. And as an apex predator, they do a lot to just keep the entire ecosystem functioning the way that it should. So a very uh, important species to conserve. I know. Perry himself came from Vermont originally. He was in the Green Mountains, you are okay, you're so silly. Um, you guys can see his beautiful pointed wings while he's <laughs> positioned this way. Hi, I know, I know, I know, I know. You need to settle down. Um, so he was originally brought to us from Vermont. The Green Mountains have a beautiful population of peregrine falcons. Um, and he originally flew into a, a power transformer and was very badly electrocuted when he did that. So this side of his body um, has significant neurological damage and muscular damage to it. And he is no longer able to fly or get up off the ground, do those, um, those very fast dives towards the ground. He isn't really able to do that anymore. Um, male raptors are also the primary hunter for a mated pair of raptors. So a female and a male, the female will sit on the nest and defend young. Um, they're often bigger. In fact, in peregrine falcons, they're almost twice as large. Um, and the male is usually the one that goes off and hunts for the entire nest. And so the males that we um, rehabilitate really need to be in perfect condition in order to go back out into the wild and be successful. And Perry just would not be able to provide for a family, let alone hunt on his own in the wild. So this swing over here, he's not really able to use anymore. Um, and so he will live with us at the Center for Wildlife for the rest of his life, but he is a wonderful ambassador. He's very sweet. Um, he was originally brought to the Vermont Institute of Natural Sciences in Keechee, Vermont, and they transferred him to us when they deemed him non-releasable. And we're very fortunate to have Perry. Nice job, Perry. Perry is around um, seven or eight years old. He was brought to us in 2012 as an adult bird. So we assume that he is around seven or eight years old. Uh, peregrine falcons in the wild can live into their teens um, pretty routinely, and then in captivity can live well past 20. Um, so we are hopeful that we'll have Perry with us for a long time. When animals are in captivity, they do usually live a little bit longer. They uh, are able to um, get plenty of food. They don't have to worry about uh, parasites or illnesses or predators. So um, when they're in captivity, they do usually live a little bit longer. Um, Something that's cool about peregrine falcons is their feathers and their coloring actually change. As they get older, they tend to darken all over, um, so they become more uh, more dark gray, and the 
feathers on their chest tend to darken as well. Um, they also will grow um, these very dark sideburns as they get older and when they reach the age of about 10 years old, their entire cheek will be completely black. So you can see Perry has these stripes under his eyes now, but once he gets to be um, about 10 years old, that, will that whole cheek will be black in color. Um, so they do change as they age, which is pretty cool. And uh, peregrine falcons and other bird eating uh, birds, other bird eating raptors are often birds that we might see in our backyards near our bird feeders. Um, when we put out a bird feeder and we attract a lot of songbirds to our feeders, we're actually really attracting the whole food chain, including all of the predators to those bird feed those uh, songbirds. So we um, we like to say that the bird feeder is really feeding the whole food chain <laughs> and um, helping to feed the predators as well as um, the prey animals. So these uh, these are a little less likely to be seen at bird feeders. Cooper's hawks, sharp chin hawks, they are usually um, more commonly seen at feeders. Yeah, you're such a good boy. Next up, we have our smallest owl species that we have here in Maine. Owls are only nocturnal raptors that we see in our area. So she is a really special little, little lady. We're going to be meeting Artemis, our northern saw wet owl. Okay. I know, I know, I know. You're okay. Hi. Good girl. Okay. Hi. I know, I know, I know. Come on. You're okay. Can you stand up? There you go. Good girl. Hi. This is Artemis. Artemis is our little saw wet owl ambassador from the Center for Wildlife. She is um, the smallest species of owl we have here in Maine, um, which is saying something uh, because she only really weighs about as much as a lemon. And she, um, she is incredibly, incredibly petite and tiny. She's actually a little puffy because it's colder out. Um, but she is very, very small, but that doesn't mean she's not an incredible hunter. These guys are, still have our raptor's talons, their special um, feet that are incredibly strong. Owls have among the strongest grips um, in the raptor world. And she is you know, really, really good at grabbing and holding on to her prey. Sawat owls in the wild will catch mice that often weigh three to four times as much as they do and lift them off. Into so they're incredibly strong birds. They're incredibly um, flighted. Artemis here was brought to us after she was hit by a car and uh, sustained an injury to the long bone in her wing called the humerus. Um, she was brought to Tufts Wildlife Clinic in Grafton, Massachusetts, and what's incredible about them is that they were actually able to fix that break enough that Artemis was able to keep her wing. Um, she unfortunately lost some feathers and, um, and is no longer able to fly, but she did not have to have her wing amputated, so they really saved her wing by pinning this incredibly tiny, hollow little bone about the width and um, you know, length of a toothpick, um, pinning that together and having her heal, uh, it was just incredible. So she was brought to us after they, um, you know, determined that she was not going to be able to fly anymore. Um, and she's been with us for about five years now. Um, she is most likely six to seven years old. She was an adult when she was found as well and spent about a year with Tufts healing and recovering from her from her surgery and from her injury. So she's most likely uh, between six and seven, which is for a sawed owl, actually pretty senior. So in the wild, they would only live to be about five or six years old. And then in captivity, they might live 
to be about 10. So we will have Artemis hopefully for a few more wonderful years. She's an incredible ambassador. Um, owls are often hit by cars because they are found hunting near the roadways at night when it is dark. It is hard for motorists to see them until they fly right in front of their cars. We at the center are always trying to make sure that we educate people as much as possible about keeping trash, garbage, food off of the roadways um, to prevent small mammals like mice and rodents from tr look, coming to that area, gathering in that area for food which um, can then attract predators like Artemis to that area for food as well. Um, so by keeping all of that off of our roadways, we're really making the road as unattractive a place as possible, as safe as possible for our wild animals. Um, but in the case of owls, it is difficult because they are hunting at night, hunting near the roads at night, and it is often hard to see them until they're right in front of your car. So uh, owl, um, car collisions are actually very common. Very often when an owl is hit by a car, it will sustain some sort of an injury to its head and to its eyes. Owls have incredibly large eyes to allow them to see in low light conditions. They take up a large portion of the room in their skulls and when they are hit really anywhere in the head, it's pretty much a guarantee that they're going to have an eye problem. So um, Artemis here does also have some eye issues as well. Um, as she got older, we also noticed she was losing her vision. So she, um, she doesn't see as well as she used to. And we've you know, adapted her enclosure to make sure that she is able to get around safely um, without very much vision, with limited vision. Um, but she does uh, an incredible job of teaching a lot of really amazing lessons about um, making sure that we're not throwing trash on the roads and also about caring for animals as they get older. We have many representatives of our ambassador team that are older, that are developing a lot of the issues that old people will get um, or older uh, humans will get like um, eye issues. We have a hawk with arthritis. We have a lot of, a lot of um, those more geriatric health problems we do see in our ambassadors and they're with us for their entire lives and we're happy to, um, to, help, them, uh, to help them live their, their best lives out in captivity. So she does a great job. She's very, very sweet. And you can see she is looking around. I know, I know. And um, something that's really amazing, you're okay. Here, I'll start that over again. You can see she is looking around as if she's seeing what's around her, uh, but Artemis actually is mostly blind. So when she looks around, she's actually using her hearing. Um, she is moving her head around, but she's using her ears to figure out what's around her. Um, as she kind of lost her vision, we noticed her relying on her ears more and more. Owls have incredible hearing. They're able to pinpoint noises really well out in the woods. Sawat owls actually have completely like offset ears. So like one is up here and one is down here and that allows them to figure out if they hear something coming from up this way, they know um, to look up or to fly off in the opposite direction. If they hear something coming from down below them, they know to look down, to pounce in that area. Um, so they actually have offset ears and that allows them to figure out where noise is coming from really, really quickly. Um, and Artemis has used that to her advantage as she has lost her vision. So it's pretty interesting to see her kind of using, using that extra sense. Um, but she is wonderful. She does a great job. Um, and we are so lucky to have such a sweet little owl. She is, <laughs> she is a uh, very tiny and is actually not the smallest owl in the world, which is incredible. There are smaller owls out there in um, the deserts out west. There's the elf owl that's even tinier than Miss Artemis. Um, so she is tiny, but still very mighty and, um, and not even the smallest that we would see in the wild. So. Next, we have one of our beautiful turtle species that call Maine home. They are um, 
somewhat rare in our area and an endangered species throughout the state. So we're going to be meeting Ginger, our box turtle ambassador. Hi, bud. What are you doing? Hi. This is Ginger. Ginger is an eastern box turtle. Uh, box turtles are unique for the shape of their shell and the function that their shell has. Uh, most turtles will have a top and a bottom to their shell that are two pieces of bone. They'll have a top called a carapace and a bottom called a plastron. And in most species of turtles, those two pieces are um, connected at the sides, but they're each one piece of, of hard bone. This uh, type of turtle, the box turtle, uh, is known for having two pieces to their plastron, two pieces of bone, and those are connected with a hinge. And they're the only type of turtle that has this hinge in the middle of their plastron, and that allows them to close up their shell in front of their face like a trap door, so it can close up to protect their face and their front legs, and then they can also close up the back of their shell to protect their tail and their back legs. So they're the only type of turtle that can really do that to protect themselves. They also are known for having a really tall domed shell and all of their limbs fit into that shell and can be perfectly protected in there. Um, Ginger came to us after he was found in the wild as a small turtle and essentially poached for the pet trade. This is something that used to be common. It's now illegal in the state of Maine to remove these species of turtles from the wild because they are so endangered, but it is still something that can happen. And, um, and their, their numbers are definitely significantly decreased because of the activity of poaching small turtle hatchlings from the wild and keeping them as pets. So uh, we see this happening quite a bit at the Center for Wildlife. People will keep turtles for one to five years as pets and then try to release them again. And those turtles may not have any idea how to be a wild turtle, how to return back to the wild. In the case of box turtles, they really need to be released exactly where they were found. They've been relying on the same habitat for thousands and thousands of years and really need to go back to that very specific place that they were that they were found in originally. Um, when people find baby turtles in the wild, they're usually very small and might even be a little squishy. Um, turtle hatchlings are usually hatched from the egg at around the size of maybe a quarter and stay that small for the first year of their life. They're very susceptible to predation at that time, but they are not supposed to be with a, a grown-up turtle. They don't ever really meet their parents. They are okay to be on their own. It's a part of their uh, natural history. It's a part of their life cycle to be on their own at that small size. Um, and turtles will lay many, many eggs and maybe one or two of those babies will make it into adulthood. Um, another challenge for box turtles is that they do have to make it to their teens before they're able to reproduce. So they have to go from a tiny little hatchling, survive for as many as 15 to 17 years before they're able to lay their own eggs and have their own babies. So those things have all kind of added up to uh, box turtles being very rare in the state of Maine, being a species of greatest conservation need, which is how Maine um, describes their endangered species. So very, um, very important animal to conserve. They really enjoy the vernal pool habitats that we have in our area here at Mount Agamenicus. They really love this water system that we have, the uh, system of vernal pools and ephemeral streams. Um, these are amazing for box turtles to wade in, to eat larvae of ticks and mosquitoes in. So they are very important in the habitat that we're located in on Mount Agamenicus, um, but very rare um, in the area as well. Now that, um, you know, this part of Maine is more developed than it's ever been, these guys are having a harder and harder time. Uh, Ginger was somebody's pet, like I mentioned. He was uh, brought to the center in 2008 um, after being a pet for many years, so he will not be able to go back out into the wild. We also don't know where he came from originally, so we would not be able to get him back to his ancestral 
grounds where he would um, he would be able to succeed in the wild. So we do have four box turtles in total that all came to us um, because of the pet trade. So we have four box turtle ambassadors that live with us permanently and Ginger is one of those. Um, but they're all fantastic. They're great teachers. They're very patient um, and they're beautiful. Uh, these guys are really well camouflaged to blend in with the forest floor. Um, the patterns on their shells are meant to mimic the leaf litter on the forest floor. So they are uh, just a beautiful, beautiful species that we're very lucky to have. And the more south that you go along the seacoast area, the more likely you are to find box turtles. So they're more common the more south you go. Nice job. We do suspect that uh, Ginger is somewhere around 40 to 50 years old. We're not sure. All of our box turtles we suspect are within that age range. Once they get to this size, that's a pretty good guess. So um, we can't know for sure, but somewhere in the you know 40 to 50 age range is, um, would not be surprising for Ginger here. Very long lived species. We will um, often, you know, hear reports of people getting a turtle as a pet and then having it for the rest of their lives, having to pass it down to their children because species like box turtles can live to be in excess of 100 years old. So we will have these guys for a long, long time and um, they are often not a good pet choice for that reason is that they live excessively long. <laughs> And they can live even longer in the wild. Um, they often will live longer in the wild than in captivity, which is backwards from a lot of other animals because caring for turtles is very, very hard, very tricky, requires a lot of maintenance and special equipment. So it's hard to do it right. But we, we, love, we love being able to provide our box turtles with beautiful new enclosures here at our new building. Um, they're going to have especially beautiful tanks um, in the new nature center that were built for us by Portland Glass and they are really exciting and we're going to be getting them in the next week so we're really excited for that. Nice job! You're gonna get a new house! Yeah! The next ambassador we're going to meet is not a native of the state of Maine, but he does have cousins that live here. In Maine, we really only have two types of reptiles that uh, can deal with the cold of our winters. We have turtles, like ginger, and then we also do have snakes. All of the snakes that we have in Maine are constrictors. This means that they wrap around their food to kill them instead of a venomous snake that will bite and envenom their prey and then wait for them to die of the venom and eat them that way. So all of the snakes that we have in Maine are these constrictor snakes. They are all harmless and really great for controlling pests like mice. Um, they are wonderful to have in our backyards and in our habitats. Um, we have some cousins of um, this type of snake I'm going to introduce you to in Maine, um, but not this specific type of snake. Um, so we're going to meet Zipper. He is our corn snake ambassador. Hi bud. He's like wrapped around the hot water bottle. <laughs> Hi. Okay. Zipper is our corn snake ambassador. Uh, corn snakes are one of the most common pet trade snakes that exist. Um, they are bred for the pet trade. They do occur naturally in the wild. Um, you have to go pretty far south and west to see them. Uh, but they are called corn snakes because they're found in cornfields in the wild. They like to eat the um, and grain stores actually, cornfields and grain stores. They like to eat the small rodents that go to those large piles of food to, um, to eat all the grain. And so farmers actually love these guys, love snakes, love predators of um, any type of rodent because they do help to keep those pests, pests under control. Um, Zipper was a young boy's pet for many years. And then um, that, you know, that boy went off to college, parents couldn't take care of him anymore. So we adopted Zipper and um, he does a great job of educating about the differences between 
constrictor snakes and venomous snakes, the importance of having snakes in your habitat and why we should never hurt them intentionally or be afraid of them really. In Maine, we're very lucky. We have no species of venomous snakes that live in Maine. So all of our snakes are really harmless and truly more afraid of us than we are of them. That's the famous adage for snakes. Um, corn snakes are also potentially called corn snakes because of the uh, pattern that they have. He has this beautiful belly. We call this the ventral side. So this is the dorsal side, that's the top. And then the underside is the ventral side. And the ventral scales are a different shape because he's going to be slithering along on his belly and he wants to be able to do that smoothly. And then the sh scales on his top are that diamond shape that we know snakes for. Um, but again, one of the most common types of pet trade snake that is out there. Um, we often will see, especially with reptiles, people purchasing a reptile as a pet and then coming to understand that taking care of reptiles is really difficult. It requires special lighting, special heating, special diets. In the case of Zipper, he eats mice and he doesn't like dead mice, so he has to get alive mice about once a week and that is something that we have to go purchase and then you know give to Zipper. So it's a hard process and not everybody is up for it. Um, so really doing your research before you ever get a pet is the best thing that we recommend. He is also a reptile so they can live a very very long time. Um, he's probably around 20 years old at this point and could live well into his 20s up to 30 years old. So reptiles in general are very long-lived animals and um, he is very, very sweet. He helps to change minds about snakes quite a bit because he's so calm and gentle. Um, you know, he loves kids. Kids love to pet him and, and be introduced to him. And uh, he's just a great, a great ambassador for all snake species, but especially our constrictors in Maine. So he does have a cousin here in Maine called the, um, the black rat snake or black racer, um, it is a similar species. Very much larger though, much, much bigger. Um, so he has some cousins here, but not this species. Um, they are this beautiful red color. And this is kind of the most common color that you would see in the wild. It is very well camouflaged uh, with leaf litter, with, um, with cornfields, with all sorts of native habitat that these guys would live in. But uh, because they are bred in captivity for the pet trade, they can be found in lots of different colors. Um, you know, albino snakes exist, melanistic snakes that are entirely black and gray. So they can be seen in many different color morphs now that they've been kind of bred in captivity. But in the wild, this is what you would usually see. So most constrictor snakes really don't like to be stretched out because they, no, they can't get any leverage to move. So when they, um, when you stretch them out, they'll start doing this like bouncing thing where they'll start pulling themselves back in and they don't. But he is actually um, over six feet long when he's completely stretched out. And again, not a native species of snake to Maine, but uh, we do have five species that call Maine home and they're all close cousins of Zipper. We are here in front of the new facility of the Center for Wildlife. This is our main entrance where we'll admit over 2,000 patients every year and also where we'll welcome visitors to our new nature center and classroom. Uh, entire field trips of second grade students, um, family reunions and gatherings. We're very excited for all of the opportunities that will come from being in this new space and we can't wait to welcome all of you to the new center. The ambassador enclosures at the new Center for Wildlife will be here. They'll be moving soon, uh, shortly, most likely this spring. We're really excited to have our ambassadors in their, uh, in their permanent home. Um, there will also be a mud kitchen for children to practice uh, preparing food for wild animals and um, a natural playground as well. Um, there'll be a bird blind where visitors can observe birds in the forests around us and uh, a lot of wonderful activities for 
our kiddos to, to enjoy. So this is the new permanent home of the, the ambassadors once they move over. Thank you all so much for joining us. We're really excited to be at our new facility here, and we are so excited to hopefully be opening up in the next couple of months by 2021 at the latest. Um, thank you again for tuning in and for watching, and we can't wait to see you soon at the Center for Wildlife.